has brought us into this banqueting hall, and his banner over us is love. Good day, dear viewer, and welcome to Bible Banquet. Welcome to another exciting moment of Bible study. There's been a lot of speculation concerning the identity of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. For some, these witnesses refer to specific biblical characters, while for others, it refers to the witness of both Old and New Testaments. We invite you to join us as we go in search of a more comprehensive understanding of this concept of the two witnesses. We are Samuel Ngoekubamfo, Theodore Dixon, and Constance Mosu. We'd like to begin with a word of prayer. We will invite Theodore to pray for us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us to the table as we study your word we ask for inspiration and direction from the holy spirit illumine our hearts and mind and grant us utterance and help that our viewers will have knowledge of your word and that all of us will come to understand and unto salvation in jesus name amen, amen. Special greetings to our lovely audience on facebook on youtube and on satellite tv uh, from the bottom of our heart, we say thank you for being there. Thank you for holding the fort. Thank you for praying. Thank you for encouraging us day after day. And also, thank you for studying with us. Today, we want to focus on this concept of the two witnesses to find out what uh, more the Bible has to reveal as to the identity and their function. So we'll begin by reading from the book of John, John chapter 5, verse 39. I am reading that passage from the New King James Version. John chapter 5, 39 says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. The second passage I will be reading is found in Luke chapter 24, and I'm reading verses 25 to 27. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. We also read Zechariah chapter 4, verses 2, 6, and 14. Constance, would you want to read that for us? Zechariah chapter 4, verses 2, 6, and 14, reading from the New King James Version. That's right. And he said to me, what do you see? Verse 6. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 14. So he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord on the whole earth. Mm. Let's also read Revelation chapter, chapter 11. 11, 3 to 6. That's right. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Amen. 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 So there in Revelation chapter 11, we come back to that concept of the two witnesses. So how does Revelation 11 verses 3 to 6 and a few other passages we've read help us understand this idea of the two witnesses as it is used in the Bible? Well, my idea of the two witnesses, uh, I think I want to begin the discussion from First John chapter 5. Yeah. Because if you go to First John chapter five and read from verse six up to up to eight, it says, 
This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Now it says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. Now, I, I went here to just let us know that the Bible speaks about witnesses in different, mm -hmm. in different places and di different contexts. We, we talk about spirit, water, and blood. We talk about, um, the, John talked about Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And then there is also the witness of men and the witness of God. But going back to, going back to the passages we read, Jesus Christ said in John chapter 5, verse 39, that the scriptures testify of him, which means the, the word of God is a witness or mm -hmm. serves as a witness. And in Luke chapter 24, when Jesus ran into the disciples who were, who were on the way to Amos, you know, and we are confused, it was the scripture that he expanded yes. to them, which he said, these things bear witness of me. So if you combine the two together, we see that the scripture is presented here as a witness. Now, fast forward to Revelation chapter 11. The context of Revelation chapter 11, particularly when we look at verse 3, helps to shed light, particularly the time prophecy that is connected with verse 3. It says, and I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. This witness, or witnesses, whoever they are, whatever they are, will work for a period of time. And mm -hmm. it is that period of time that helps me to understand that this witness is not a person. Because this person will not work for 1,260 days. Now, recall that Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 13 also uses 1,260 days. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, used time, times, and the dividing of time. time. Revelation chapter 13, verse 5, with reference to the same time period, used 42 months. Mm -hmm. Now, who would have worked for this period? It wouldn't have been an individual. So for me, I would say that this witness referred to here is actually the word of God, reference to the word of God that we span throughout the period of time when it will we are sackcloth, that is when the word of God will be trampled upon because of some kind of um, you know apostasy. So the witness here for me is the Old and New Testament, mm -hmm. and by extension of functionally, all the saints who live within that period who stood by the word of God and made it their rule of faith. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, expounding on that. I think it's very clear. At least it's clear for me. I believe it's clear for our viewer as well. Uh, we'll take another Bible passage. Uh, but maybe before we take that, that Bible passage, uh, you have talked about these, these witnesses and you know, shown to us that uh, this could be pointing only to the witness of God's word as found in the Old and New Testaments. Uh, but what features characterize these witnesses? First of all, it says that the two olive trees that they stand on in either side of the golden lampstand, and then that the two anointed ones who stand that they are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Also talks about them as uh, feeding oil into the lampstand, so that they, it continues to give light all the time. It mentioned that the two witnesses, uh, you know, have power, that people who oppose them, people who oppose them or try to harm them, would uh, they will be in trouble, let me say in, in mm -hmm. my own words. So, and it even mentioned somewhere that they prophesied and they kept rain from falling, you know, for three and a half uh, years. You know, when Elijah, Elijah prophesied. And then 
that also they smooth the water and turn the water into blood and smooth the earth with plague. So, uh, like Theodore said uh, a few minutes ago, it's not humans that we are doing this. It was the word of God that was pronounced that uh, gave it was power accomplishing that, that to accomplish all those things. He also said that they will prophesy for 1,260, which you have said. So these features help to clarify that we are not talking about humans. We are talking about the Old and the New Testament, the Word of God from the beginning to the, to end. the end. Wow. Let's read Revelation 12, 5, 6, and 14. Theodore, you read that, as well as Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Revelation 12, 5, 6, and 14. That's right. reading from the New King James Version. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Verse 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Daniel, Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High shall persecute the sense of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the sense shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Okay, mm. we're coming back to that discussion we've held a little mm. while ago, talking about these 1,260 days or years, this yeah. time, time, and half a time, or the 42 months which you, you, you referred to. So uh, what prophetic time period and events are, are being referred to here? Well, uh, as we talk about prophecy, it's important to note that um, this, this time period is um, used symbolically. Mm -hmm. Of course, in, in prophetic interpretation, a day refers to a year. Okay. A day refers to a year. So we are looking at a period of um, 1,260 years, which is um, like um, 42 months, months, you know, in two years. And then um, Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 referred to is as a time, times. Time, times, and the dividing of time. Now that is talking about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And three and a half years, in, you know, turn into days will still give us 1,260. Um, this time period is part of the time that we find in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, which says, Unto 2,300 days shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, if you look at that time period, we see that the, the commencement of the, of the 42 weeks or the 1,260 years began in 538 A.D. And what is it about 538 A.D.? 538 A.D. was the time when the Romans, um, it, it, it was the time when Emperor Justinian handed over the political, the civil, and the religious power to Pope know, vigilis. And it was at that time that the era of um, what we call um, pagan reign in the Roman Empire ended. Uh, it was a time when the Roman Church assumed not just ecclesiastical leadership, but also, civil. you know, civil and political leadership in, in history. And that marked the beginning of what is now referred to as the Dark Ages. Mm. And w w the, 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 it, it's, it's a period of time when the church was instituted as um, having authority, or first of all, having the key to heaven and uh, you know, hell, 
that the, the popes were recognized as as um, or, or her priest, the Pope was recognized as the figure of God. the Son of, of God representing Christ on earth and her priest as having authority to forgive sin. Uh, the church began to sell indulgences, uh, give certificate of indulgences and people made, made penance even for the dead. And um, infant baptism and issues of purgatory all became Arose. the order of the day. And this continued for for a period of 1260 years of the Dark Ages, culminating into 1798 AD, when General Berthier, you know, of France came in and seized the Pope and took him captive, and that brought an end to, to what is called um, the Papal reign in the Roman Empire. So that's the time period that is being referred to, a time when truth was swept under carpet, a time when the priestly ministry of Jesus Christ was was eclipsed hmm. uh, uh, and uh, as was replaced by uh, by the earthly, you know, earthly priesthood uh, as established by the Roman Church. Wow. And so uh, we are talking about this period of history where uh, it's all dark, the truth is being trampled upon, oh, as yes. you've said. And uh, we want to, s to find out what happens a little beyond that. Because in Revelation chapter 11, verses 7 to 9 and verse 11, uh, there's some other truth that the Bible talks about and which I want us to read. Uh, Revelation 11, uh, verses 7 to 9, it says, When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and, uh, three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And then jumping to verse 11, it says, Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. So um, these passages talk about the witnesses being killed and uh, later on being, being resurrected. But I want us to read uh, a number of other passages together so that we can have a broader understanding. We'll read Psalm 119, line 89, and Psalm 111, line 7 and 8. Psalm 119, line 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And then Psalm 111, line 7 and 8. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. Amen. Amen. So um, here we have uh, two other things that are happening. We've talked about, we've established uh, who or what these two witnesses are. And then when we get to Revelation 11, it talks about these witnesses being killed. And uh, Revelation, still Revelation 11, verse 11, talks about these witnesses coming back to life. Now how we to understand um, this uh, symbolic interpretation? The witnesses being killed, the witnesses receiving breath and being restored back into life. What in history um, can be termed as parallels to help us understand uh, these processes, or these images? Something happened during the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. The government officially established what they called the cult of reason. And they, they wanted to show their allegiance to aesthetic religion at that time. And um, with this, they wanted to use this aesthetic religion to replace Christianity. And uh, on November 10, specifically 1793, they held what they called the Festival of Reason. Mm. And all the churches all over France were converted into temples of reason. So they were uh, making a way, doing away with the Bible and Christianity. And they enthroned the woman as the goddess of reason. And Bibles were burned at that time and um, on the streets. 
and they declared that God did not exist mm. and started, uh, stated that death was to be an endless sleep. So they just went their way. Somebody will say somebody is going haywire. They mm. completely turned 100, 120 uh, degrees against Christianity and made sure that even churches uh, were not in existence. And so that's how the two witnessed, because we said in our previous discussion that the Bible, you know, from our own reading and understanding, these two witnesses represented the Word of God, the Old and the mm -hmm. New Testament. So when they were closed and turned, they were unburned, and churches were closed. That means death mm -hmm. for the Word of God. That is what they tried to do. So that's how they were killed and were laid on the street because they were brought out on the street and destroyed. And, and destroyed. Wow. Yeah, the, 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 the other part of it is the fact that um, in spite of all of that, we see that by the time the, the age of enlightenment and reason was restored, at the same time we see God opening a new window, mm -hmm. you know, because um, by, by, by the time um, that was happening, the, the French Revolution and the rest of it, the study of the Word of God also opened. The reformers were at it again. This time around, we see somebody called um, William Miller coming to study the Bible. We see his interest coming to around the Word of God. And many people come to the knowledge of God, which shows that at, at, at the turn of events, the Word of God actually you know, stood still and was triumphant again. Um, characteristic of what I read from Psalm 119, the word of God is settled in heaven. Nobody mm -hmm. can do anything about that word of God because in spite of all the troubles that, that was born, in spite of the fact that the Bible was born, God still raised a people and his word was revisited again. Oh. Because at the time when Luther, um, sorry, at the time Miller. when William Miller studied the Bible, it was calling the attention of the people to the fact that Christ is coming. And so the, Jesus Christ and his second coming became central and the Bible was placed in the hands of the people again and they were excited mm. about discovering or rediscovering the truth. And that represents the resurrection. Yeah, the resurrection of, of, um, these of witnesses. the witnesses. Yeah. You know, there is something that happens that makes people curious. All of a sudden, I've seen that happen in other areas. You begin to bring the Bibles and begin to burn them. A curious person will say, "What is it about this? Let me go." Read about and it, then yeah. they start reading and they start discovering that, mm -hmm. you know, discovering a new what is was inside it, and then uh, that's how. They, it came alive again that people started reading the word of God and learning from it. Mm. Uh, Constance, um, let's look at Revelation 11 verses 15 to 18. We may not be able to read that, but let's, let's focus on, on those passages. Uh, definitely there's something in there that, that speaks about history. I'm wondering what historical events are, are described in Revelation chapter 11 verses 15 to 19 and how do these events affirm God's word? You want to pick a passage or two, even if we're unable to read all of that? Okay. Um, in, in, in verse 15, it was talking about the seventh angel that sounded uh, the trumpet and there were glad voices that saying that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. You know, the, we just mentioned the fact that the Bible was burnt and destroyed and, um, and, and, and Christianity was made away with in French Revolution. But, you know, it wasn't a complete thing because nobody can stand against the word of God. Mm -hmm. Nobody can stand against God mm -hmm. too. So um, when, when this is a jubilation that eventually the word of God has come back again and the and the kingdom of God has taken its roots anymore. If you look at verse 17, it says, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and on and on. You can't stand against God. You can't stand against the word of God. So no matter what you do, God has a way of turning 
things around to the point where what you thought you have destroyed came alive. So even though during that time, the Bible, they think they had destroyed it, God raised up men and women that began to preach again. And this, is, this was hallelujah because God reigned. And that, that's what I, I, I like about that passage that talk, we give you thanks, O Lord, and honor. So God took over his position one more time and there was jubilation. Mm -hmm. Well, jubilation in the sense that people were happy they had the word of God to study, mm -hmm. but it, le it landed them into a lot of trouble and killings, but that wasn't, wasn't a problem. For okay. them. And um, I think verse 18 talks about uh, um, judgment. Yes, yes. Verse 18 talks about judgment because God will stand up. God is the one who, who will judge the world. In, and what he's going to use to judge what is the same Bible that they are trampling upon. upon. Yes. Um, as we wrap this up, um, how does the knowledge of the eternal nature of God's word help us deal with this relativism of truth we've been talking about that is propounded by secularism and postmodernism? God's word endures forever. Hmm. It's unchangeable. And we can't do anything to the word of God. So the, the thing is that we must not join any effort aimed at either destroying the Word of God or undermining it. We must not fight against the Word of God. Instead, we should stand by the Word of God because the Word of God is light, the Word of God is truth, the Word of God is life. Mm. Okay, the Word of God, Jesus Christ is the Word of God. So anything anybody tries to do against the Word of God is a fight against the foundation that established heaven and earth. Because it says, forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. So we should love the word of God. You know, at, at the turn of the end of the French Revolution, people like William Carey traveled far, mm. translated the Bible into different dialects. We should love the word of God. We should preach the word of God. We should believe in the word of God and claim his promises. Because the word of God reveals Christ and it leads to eternal life. Amen. Amen. And no matter how we try to stand against it, we will not succeed mm. because it is the word of it will still raise its head. You know, if you close it this side, it will open up this side. Yeah. Costas, would you want to pray for us at this moment? Our Father, we thank you because you said your word is settled forever. And you said that you prize your word above your name. So whatever people try to do, against your word will not stand. So help us to love your word. We pray for our viewer and listener, you will impress upon them to love your word so that they will come to read it and through that find salvation in Jesus Christ. So thank you for enabling us to discuss this lesson we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for studying with us today. Until we come your way again, Keep studying God's word. He has brought us into his banqueting hall and his banner over us.